L'espoir fleurit au ciel de Paris. Sous le ciel de Paris, tout le fleuve joyeux. Ready? To break a leg. Bonjour and welcome to Ignite, which is the showcase of the best teachers of journalism from around the world. This is coming to you from the World Journalism Education Congress held here in Paris today, Thursday, the 11th of July, 2019. And many thanks to the wonderful people here at the University of Paris Dauphine for their hospitality. The Broadcast Education Association in the United States, but with members worldwide, is sponsoring this event. Heather Burks is the Executive Director.
Michael Bruce is the Senior Faculty Fellow of BEA and a broadcast professor at the University of Alabama, the executive producer and director this morning. I am here to tell you that you have the opportunity for audience participation this morning. One of the things that you do can do is vote on your favorite presentation that's delivered today. And you will see on the screen later today a uh, slide for the, the uh, application called WooClap. Uh, it allows you to vote online or using your phone through text. And when you see that slide, it will give you instructions about how you can vote for your presentation. So as the pr presenters go through their presentations this morning, uh, please keep note of your favorite. At the end, you'll be given the opportunity to vote. And uh, I'll give you a few more instructions about that at the end. The uh, top presenter, as voted on by you, will be presented a nice little plaque, top presenter plaque, at the closing ceremony today. Thank you, Michael. Now, this is the third time that BEA has produced Ignite at WJEC, something done every year at BEA's annual meeting in Las Vegas in Nevada in April. By the way, my name is Bill Silcock. I'm the Assistant Dean for Global Programs and for Research at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University. And I'm Deborah Wilson-David. I'm currently the Deputy Head of School of English and Journalism at the University of Lincoln in the UK and soon to be the Head of Department at Nottingham Trent University for Journalism and Media. And I'm Andrew David, and I don't have as long a thing to talk to you about. I'm the <laughs> managing editor of Siren Radio, an internationally recognized community radio station at uh, Deborah's former institution, the University of Lincoln. And also part of our team, we have Ken Fisher. Out uh, in the audience. Out in the audience. Give a, a applause for Ken from Gaylord College in Oklahoma. That's our team today. Yes, but you have not come here for us, obviously, to see us live. You've come here to see them, the 12 wonderful folks that are sitting down there waiting in the wings, who are going to use the Ignite format to enlighten us, but make it quick. These are the semi-finalists who submitted their teaching slide decks to a juried panel. Now they're going to present them live here at WJEC in Paris, and you, the audience, will vote for the winner, who will be announced, as Michael said, later this afternoon at our closing meeting. Now, everyone should be logged in to vote. And a final word, so you, the live audience, and those watching, understand the rules that the 12 have agreed to follow. So here they are, they each have four, count them four minutes and up to 20 slides to share the successful classroom projects and exercises. If they go over, what happens? Beep. Uh, something like that, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is where I, as voiceover man, get to sound like John Wesley because John Wesley, I'm not joking, he was in fact a vicar and started the Methodist movement, of course, and in fact his vicarage was not very far away from where we come from in Lincoln in the United Kingdom. And he said, believe it or not, of his public speeches, here I go into John Wesley voice, I set myself on fire and people come to see me burn. Ooh. Well, we cheesy link now, we are ready to ignite the world with some practical professional educator teacher training tips via Ignite at WJEC. So let's give a round of applause to the 12 who've already made it this far and we'll see who's going to be the winner. Come on up. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to GIFs for Journalists, one of my favorite presentations to give. Um, before the session, you may be able to download Jiffy Cam on your phones. This is a participatory session. So if you have time, download Jiffy Cam for your phones, create a GIF during the session, and post it on social. Um, first, I'd like to start with setting the record straight. How do you pronounce GIF? Is it GIF or GIF? Any, any thoughts on that? <laughs> Good news, Oxford Dictionary accepts both pronunciations, so you're both right. <laughs> um, 
when I present GIFs to my students, I like to talk about the importance of visuals. Um, visuals are very important when it comes to social media. Uh, content with visuals are more likely to be shared. They're more engaging, they're more powerful. Visuals can bring information to life. And GIFs are these in-between options that help you do that. So this can be a really powerful tool for our students in their mobile journalism toolbox that they can use to tell stories. And what's really awesome about GIFs is they're really fun to produce. And there's so many examples we see um, in the journalism industry today of how they're used. Um, I talk to students about how they can load quickly, they're mesmerizing, um, they're easy to create, they can add movement and action. Here's one example. My student used one, she was doing a story on haunted hotels, and she started her website with a GIF of the, the drapes blowing slowly um, in that hotel. So it was a really engaging way to start on the web. Um, in addition, we know GIFs are short, they're looped, they're silent, they use the power of suggestion. Oftentimes, they're used um, to add funny reactions. You can create your own GIFs right from your mobile phone. You can use your um, DSLR, you can use video clips, or create custom animations. What's really amazing about GIFs is they can highlight a key moment of a story. So they don't always have to be used in a humorous way. Um, here, they were used to um, show highlights from the Olympics. So we can see um, these were really, really popular. People loved these um, as the Olympics was being covered. In addition, they can be used in serious reporting um, with depth. Here's an example of how they were used to report about um, Ebola in Liberia. And there were a series of GIFs used to present the data with this story. So they can definitely add depth and empathy. Different types of GIFs include capturing moments, um, capturing what we also call photo bursts, which, which can be more choppy, um, but can get you to the action quickly. Um, in addition, they are mesmerizing, they add immediacy to a story, um, they're quick to produce, and they can hold your attention. So these are some ways that they can really be used very effectively in journalism. However, they can also be a little distracting. Anyone from LA will remember this uh, anchor on the air when an earthquake hit. This was actually a few years ago. Um, I know you're not reading my text right now. You're probably just staring at that GIF. So they can be distracting, so we want to be careful about how we use them. And not over-sentimentalize as well. Um, in addition, I do like to address legal aspects of GIF. When can you use them? When can you not use them? Um, there are plenty of examples of where um, people grab them from the internet. They're very hard to trace their users. There's also an example of SB Nation getting kicked off Twitter for using NFL images in their GIFs. So that legal aspect is really important um, to convey as we're looking at GIFs. So how do you use them effectively? Use them in social, use them in stories. You can use them for data. This is Data GIF Maker. From, uh, supported by the Google News Lab that you can use. You can also use them to create uh, interesting photos. Instead of a group shot, we did a GIF of our team one time. They can capture emotion. Um, they can show a process. They can capture key moments in a story. So don't forget, make your GIF with Jiffy Cam. I have some more sources on here. And thank you very much for your time. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here so early, bright and early. And we're going to play a couple of games uh, to illustrate how we can jazz up our teaching. Classrooms are often less exciting than they can be, and students are often staring out into space at the beginning of a class or just getting acquainted with what we're doing. Um, so what do you see? Look at that pictogram. What do you see in that pictogram? Could be anything. There's no wrong answers. There's no right answers. This is a descriptive game. The idea is to use our eyes and then to use our minds. Great, great example. So this is what some students have said, and there are actually hundreds of answers I've compiled now, and the idea is something very simple, something very quick can be very useful. 
Here's another kind of game. This is more of an imaginative kind of game. This is a generative game. The idea is to generate lots of possibilities, lots of ideas. Think out of the box. Think creatively. Shut down the creative side, which we're so good at, at using, and use our imaginative side. So students in this game come up with anything that could be useful for journalism. And it's really an, an opportunity just to be creative and think wild thoughts. This third game is more of an action game. This is more curricular related. This is about taking a story live from the news. So this pulls from a live news feed and it assigns a particular story type, an audio story. It gives you a length of time, a constraint, like six hours or one week. And students quickly come up with a pitch for an idea for a project they would pursue. It's just for fun, so it's not evaluated, it's not analyzed, it's just a quick warm up and it gets students excited. So we have descriptive games, we have generative games, and we have action games or news related games. That's three categories. Now, um, wh why do we do this? What's the benefit? Well, first of all, we spark some creativity. We get people involved in, in a mindset that's open-minded, right? We have some fun. We make the classroom a place which is exciting and enjoyable. And um, we, we want to make sure when we're doing this that students understand why we're doing this. Is this just to wake up? Is this to generate some new ideas that we're going to use in class? Um, it's important to bring students along. It's also important to um, make sure that the efficient sharing of it doesn't take away too much of our class time. So I like to do these with, in five minutes. I think they should engage everyone, so everyone should be involved. They should be really brief. They should be a little bit challenging so that students have to think a little bit. Um, and they should be fun so that we actually have smiles and, and excitement when we start our classes. And they also work well in middle of a class. So the beginning and the middle I find are the optimal times for these and I try to do them in five minutes. So I want to leave you with a resource that you can actually use and I'd love your input to it to add to it because this is something that I've been building. It's a list of games that are useful in classroom settings specifically for these kind of short interactive games. So this is bit.ly slash games for class. It's a Pinterest page and it's one use of Pinterest I've found. And um, I'd love you to add to it and, and feel free to steal any of the games, use any of them that are relevant to you. Um, these are a couple of specific names of ones and um, these are games that I like to use quite, quite frequently. These slides, by the way, are all at that link, bit.ly slash idea jamming. So if you wanna go back to these individual slides, you can see it there. And I just tweeted it out as well. So these are some tools that I use for digital interaction. Um, yesterday, those of you who are at the morning session um, that I moderated, we used both Kahoot and um, Slido, and there are many others like this. If you have others to recommend, I'd love you to tweet out those um, recommendations. I have a couple games to give out, actually. If anyone tweets out some interesting stuff, um, find me, I'll give you a, a game, and if I don't have any left with me in my bag, I'll, I'll send you um, some. We, we made a game ourselves, and we'd send it out for free. Um, I think students learn best when they're engaged. Pedagogically, this makes sense. It avoids students getting bored. It, it gets students excited about coming to class. Um, it, helps them, it helps them think about all these new kinds of skills and the games can touch on all of these new kinds of skills we're trying to build. Um, and, and especially in this new entrepreneurial era, it helps us touch on interesting kinds of things. One game is sell me a pencil, sell your colleague a pen, right? You just turn to a colleague and practice the skill of sales just for fun, just quickly, just for two minutes. Um, we want to make our teaching fun, right? These are the things we want in our teaching. We want our teaching to be exciting. Let's jazz up our classroom. Let's make teaching and learning really fun and exciting. Thank you. As we're talking about jazzing up our teaching, let's talk about jazzing up those resumes too. Not just our students, but maybe even ours. Um, when you think about, think about resumes, news directors and employers, as they're going through, you know, these are the types of resumes that we have to apply to as human, with human resources, but man, aren't those boring? Look, they're black and white, and they're just very blah. Well, let's jazz it up just a little bit. Let's add some color to it and put a twist on that tradition. Uh, if you think about adding some pops of color, you can really, uh, and some icons, it becomes eye candy. As people are flipping through, most news directors that I know, what they do is they're looking at your resumes while they're on the phone or on the iPad. Well, it, with these icons, uh, this student established a social media presence, and the visuals and the icons help tell the story. Now, that one may look a little busy, but it's just like her website is on one page. Well, those infographics... Um, that we've all heard about, you turn those into resumes, and it has really made a huge difference for my students in getting hired. The employers love them. Uh, even the parents love them because they say, I can figure out everything about my child and what they've been doing by looking at one page. Uh, this one of Juliet's is a lot more organized. I think it's a little better layout than the first one. 
Uh, it's very quick and easy to read. And it also highlights very relevant categories for her. She's a very accomplished student. And the organization is the key. Uh, over here to the bottom left, you can really see her skills and proficiencies, which is something that uh, every employer looks for. And then the templates on infographics are very easy to customize. There's also these examples of like colored resume graphics, uh, which also capture the eye very quick and easily, and the color separates the information very quick and easy for an employer. When they're flipping through, you've got to have something that catches the employer's eye. Uh, icons help define the job skills, and you can also, on the bottom, you can also incorporate video and photos, which make it very interactive and also very web and social media friendly for someone to see and to share. Um, infographics are not new. Uh, many of you may use them for certain things. There's several different programs uh, that are free and easy to use, but it's all about how you use them. Um, they take less than an hour, and students love it. Uh, many of them are not very graphic heavy and uh, have a way to do graphic programs. And so this reveals a whole new look for portfolios, and it's one of the favorite exercises that my students do. Um, and there's tons of customizable templates that they take to heart. Um, it's a great exercise in graphic design uh, with students who have very little experience. Also, ThingLink is another one. And as you'll see, as it goes across the screen, this student, um, Haley, highlights all of her different skills on the homepage of her website. And this sets herself apart. It's very interactive using pictures and videos. And um, she did a very good job of focusing on her skills. And it's an easy to build on free version of ThingLink, ThingLink.com. Um, and it made it very memorable. Everybody that I sent that to wanted a copy of it. They're like, how did they do that? Um, and one of the things you'll notice at the top uh, too is the tabs should be uh, very light. You only need four or five for the most important ones. Um, and use drop down menus if you're doing portfolios for students to make it very easy for an employer to see. Um, also think about contrasting the colors uh, and make them so you can make them want to keep thinking. Uh, this is another example of Shelby's uh, where she made it interactive. But however you do portfolios, make sure you put priority on the tabs. And then also the drop down menu should be very simple. If you have multimedia skills, make sure they're highlighted and emphasized. And if they have certifications, also make sure all those certifications are on there and that your students are marketable. Thank you. Hello, I'm Dale Cressman, and I like to teach media history, and in the past few years, I've become passionate about teaching about the history of the civil rights movement, and I do it uh, through lectures and groups, and that's a conundrum because we, but we all know that uh, groups don't seem to work and lectures don't engage, and so how do I do this? I've actually come across a method that works for me, in fact, it's been so successful that students uh, end up really liking it and it's become the most meaningful teaching that I've done in my career thus far. It helps that I've got a Pulitzer Prize winning book that most of you have heard of, The Race Beat, that uh, students also happen to love. How do I do it? Well, first thing is the makeup of the groups. Five to six people is what the research tells us. Uh, five is the number of roles that I have that I'm going to explain, but six is okay in case someone doesn't show up for class. But anything more than six gets pretty unwieldy. And so uh, the first thing is they have to provide reading notes and upload those to our learning management system before the class begins. That's very important. And so they will provide reading notes and notes of the role they've been assigned. So what are the roles? These are uh, the five of them, and I'll go through each one of them. Obviously, the first one, discussion leader, seems to be an obvious one. You have to have someone who's going to direct the discussion. So a student is preparing for that role. And then uh, uh, a passage master. This is someone who is looking for passages that resonate with that person, and, and she thinks that those would be worthy of discussion. Uh, the next one is the uh, creative connector. This is someone who looks to see if there are any things that they've read about in those chapters that connect with things that are happening today. 
And fortunately or unfortunately, uh, there are many things that are happening in the news that connect with the civil rights movement in the 1960s. And then there's a role called devil's advocate. And this is in order to facilitate an environment in which students can learn to discuss difficult topics and, and become practiced at it. Um, uh, uh, majority white students tend, to, and all of us tend to not be very good at discussing race. And this gives someone license to bring up things that they may be afraid to bring up uh, and to honestly figure them out and unpack them. Uh, so that's the devil's advocate. We also have a reporter who is going to not only report back to the class at the end of the group discussions, but it gives me a sense of how their conversation went. Even though I'm circulating through the room, uh, um, it helps for me to see this. Um, then, I don't take attendance, but the students rate each other's performance. They rate how well the students are prepared and how, uh, how much they contributed to the discussion. And uh, then they have to upload those to the learning management system. And uh, I, if they're not on time, they don't get any points. So they have to read beforehand, and that's really important to making this work. And then I grade them based on what I think their preparation levels were based on their notes. And then the average scores from their peer reviews also adds into their uh, final grade on that. And I have rules, they can't, uh, they can't all give the same score, uh, they can't be general by saying uh, this person did a really good job, they have to be very, very specific. And I, have a, I just do by hand to figure out the averages uh, for those scores. This is not an idea that is new to me, I stole it, and uh, there's the citation, and if you give me a text, I'll be able to send you the written instructions that I use. Good morning, everyone. I'm here to talk about how to make amazing audio in class. And this is really with the idea that maybe you haven't taught audio in class before. I do have three assignments. Before I share with that with you, I just want to take you through a really quick timeline of some of the really milestone events that have happened in podcasting, as you can see here. I won't elaborate on them, but most recently, earlier this year, the purchase of Spotify, uh, Gimlet by Spotify was really instrumental and really takes podcasting into the mainstream. Therefore, we probably need to do this in class. These numbers are already outdated in terms of how many podcasts exist out there. So you can probably know that on Apple and other platforms, the numbers have uh, really increased since then. Now, these three assignments can be incorporated in your classes. Usually three to five classes is all it will take. I'm assuming that you might think this might be easy, and I want you to get rid of that assumption. Your enthusiasm will be very, very key as you try to implement these assignments in class. Three assignments are discussion, more popularly known as an interview format, also a news brief and an audio diary. First, I want to talk about the requirements for the discussion format or an interview format. Take two or three of your students, put them in the studio, maybe a room together, try to help them learn how to isolate the room. About 10 minutes is the max that you want students to sort of speak freely. I usually give the students an intro, a scripted intro, a scripted outro to get them started and they fill in the content in between. The equipment that you need for this assignment, relatively easy. They could use the mobile device. It might be tricky trying to pass it back and forth. Maybe you can set them up on some tripods in the space you're using. Uh, and also, or if you have a studio, that's even better. Uh, but you want to think about the audio editing software. You could use the open source, source software Audacity, uh, but I really think you should try and up your game. Maybe use Hindenburg, Adobe Audition, uh, GarageBand. Uh, these are platforms you probably already have. The assessment, pretty easy here. You want to look at the research the students are doing to select their stories and how they're organizing that content. Students really like this assignment. It's very uh, top heavy, and so they're really uh, very difficult for them to get used to it. But once they get used to it, they're in the habit and they absolutely love it. The next assignment is a news brief. This is really short, and students can just gather their own news. So you're kind of teaching them how to stack their stories, teaching them some news judgment. 
And also, this is gonna be fully scripted, but rather short. This is the attention span of this generation, so you don't want it to be more than two minutes. Your assessment is going to focus on the research component, also the writing component. Again, they are, they're writing this from start to finish. And also, you wanna to start to look at their narration. How are they doing on the delivery component? The last, well, I, I say that this, student, this one was not executed in class, but I actually used it for extra credit in the spring. And one of my students said that this needs to be a required assignment. She said it was really instrumental and helped her get comfortable in dealing with news. The last assignment is an audio, audio diary. I think this one is a little bit more difficult because you're doing some story structure, but I also call this assignment Snapchat for audio. Having students document their lives in 10 second, 20 second increments, gathering the net sounds as well to help tell a story. So this is gonna be an individual assignment, not a group assignment. And students are going to work on scripting a story of about two to three minutes. Again, we're keeping the, the content short and I'm trying to build on the student's skill sets and confidence. You're looking at possibly using the mobile device for the entire time, because you can just easily pull it out, use the voice memo to, get, to gather those 10-second uh, increments. The audio editing software be, will be the same as I've previous, previously mentioned, and you're looking at assessing this on uh, the components that you see here. So this is really gonna be easy for you to incorporate in your classes. Uh, students really like this one, even though it's, you know, the, the students are definitely talking about themselves, and this fits right in sources for you. I hope you get a chance to follow up on this. Good morning. My name is Mel. Let's talk about some borrowed things, numbers and the statistics for the journalist. Uh, integrated media analytics across the journalism and mass communication curriculum, a service learning approach. So the media analytics basically deal with the developing and evaluating the uh, analytics tool to analyze the digital audience data. And we, as a journalist, we are more focused on the editorial analytics. And this is uh, analytics tools used by a lot of the news rooms across the different media organizations, for example, Chartbeat, Newsweb, CrowdTangle, and Google Analytics is specifically focused on analyze online, new, online uh, audience and Adobe Analytics. Facebook Insight is more fo focused on analyze the Facebook users and the Twitter analytics shareably and the chart bit. So uh, these different media analytic tools are suggest to use uh, uh, different uh, the journalist classes. And when we analyze media analytics, the biggest challenge is how to uh, access the audience, real audience data. So the service learning is uh, suggested for the different classes. The service learning approach is suggested to use uh, to identify uh, community partners to provide the real data for the students. And also the students can access the data analyze and produce the recommendations for the community partners. So this is usually takes through the three steps. So in my class, I, uh, my audience analytics class, I formed a partnership with a local TV station. And then the way students analyze this real data from the online mobile and uh, social media platform. And then students produce a, a digital writing report and present these analytics and also the findings and offering the actionable recommendations to the client, the local TV, commercial TV stations. So this is a, a, a NBC a local affiliate the TV station is called WTHR. This station provides analytic tools, uh, at Google Analytics and the Facebook Insight, Twitter Analytics and the Instagrams. All these data available to the students to analyze to relate to their news post. And I will show you, uh, there are some of the students analyze examples here. This is use a chart beat program to analyze this social media, uh, this is TV stations, the website. So the chart beat can do the real time tracking about the online audience behavior related to their uh, news. This is the Facebook insight. So related to the Facebook news post, these analytical tools can analyze to the, which the, which sections in your uh, uh, social media posts are most attracted from the audience. And this is a crowd tangle actually can track these local TV stations, the different anchors, Thailand, the social media performance. 
for this class, I use a different uh, component to evaluate the students' the performance. And basically, this uh, include the four components, the social media computation analysis, the Google Analytics for the online audience, and the Facebook Insight for the social media users. And also, we do the text mining on the Facebook news post. So we usually go through these three, three steps, and so here is my recommend, uh, the conclusion here. We need more analytics content for the develop the critical thinking uh, among the journalism students. And also, uh, the service learning approach is suggested because the uh, community partner can provide the real data for the audience analysis for the class practice. Thanks for your attention. So, good morning. Let's add a little glamour to this. Um, Madame, Messieurs, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the OSCROSS, uh, the Cross Media Oscars. Um, uh, journalism has become awfully complicated. Uh, I mean, we have to uh, tell our stories um, through multiple channels and we have to use all these digital equipment and um, most of the time, it, it can become very restrictive. I mean, we, we, are, we, are, we want our students to be creative and to be, to, to be um, experimenting, but then, you know, the new software is too expensive for your department, and uh, if you have it, it doesn't work, or nobody knows how it works, and the IT guy isn't around. Um, and um, so the question is, uh, what do we do? Yeah? What we did, we invented a pitch contest for analog storytelling with arts and crafts. Digital to me? This analog, yeah, that doesn't <laughs> really sound digital. But we don't start digital because our students, they first have to do analyzing like various storytelling projects as best, uh, as best practice examples. And then we give them a certain topic to develop their own storytelling project, but only by using analog tools, such as paper, pens, or scissors. So um, you're just using analog tools instead of digital, why? Because it's much easier to experiment with, experiment with and they can do like anything, and nobody's excluded because they don't know the technology yet. So it's perfect for the beginning of their studies. Okay, so um, giving digital natives uh, papers and pencils, uh, are there any injuries? <laughs> no, there aren't any injuries yet. I hope this will stay like this, but it's really good because we can motivate them through the incentive of competition. We are giving them an award, the OSCROSS. So you're basically um, encouraging creativity in a fun and easy way, and you're giving an incentive by, by uh, making it an award ceremony. Uh, sounds like a good idea, so what does it look like? I can show you two examples. Uh, it's on the next slide. <laughs> Right. You know, on the left side, you can see a jump and run game. And it's about the challenges of modern society for finding the love of your life. You know, it's jump and run like Mario, I think you all know it. And it's for journalism. And on the right side, there is a three-dimensional data journalism project, which was on the same subject. As you can see, there is Tinder there. And we, or the students called it, a scrolly telling cube. So, okay, we can agree that's pretty um, um, inventive, uh, but what are your experiences with the, with the format? It worked really well because everyone participated with a lot of motivation and they had a lot of fun. And what is most important, nobody was frustrated by digital equipment. As you might know, this happened really often. 
So, okay, for the beginning of a uh, program, uh, let's sum up this. It sounds like a very, very good way to get students to think creatively, um, to do that in a fun way, to um, have a highlight of the semester at the end um, with the awards ceremony, and to hopefully memorize all this uh, really complicated stuff. Exactly. <laughs> My name is Rochelle Canigal. I teach at San Francisco State University, and I'm going to give you the 10 minute entrepreneurial challenge. Now, here's how our students, our journalists, used to get jobs legacy magazines, newspapers, websites, uh, CNN, and that's where they used to get jobs. Now they're getting jobs at startups, at new companies, or they're starting their own companies. It's our job as journalism professors to give students the tools that they need to um, take opportunities and grab them. So I teach a magazine publishing class where students work in teams to create a launch plan for a new magazine. A few years ago, a guy came in and he, from day one, wanted to start a magazine about craft beer. At the end of the semester, over the summer, he launched Liquid Bread, a craft beer magazine. Um, in the same class a few years ago, I had students who were starting a magazine, and they wanted to capture the crazy things that happen on public transit in San Francisco. Our uh, transit system is called Muni, and so they started Muni Diaries. It's still going to this day, and they've added a podcast and live performances. So we have to help students understand what the process is, something that we call the drunken walk of the entrepreneur. The idea is that you're kind of going from place to place, trying new things. You start with ideation. So you're coming up with ideas, brainstorming. Then you want to be thinking about planning, and you want to give students tools that they need to understand how to plan a business. Then you have to get them experimenting, trying new things. And you know what? Sometimes those new things are going to fail. So they need to fail fast, and then they need to pivot. They need to try something new, take the business in a new direction. And they all have to learn how to pitch. This has become an essential part of journalism today. They have to understand how to pitch their ideas, how to sell their ideas. Finally, we have to teach students how to network, how to make connections, the kind of things that we're all doing here today. So, what I propose is that you give students a scenario. This can be adapted to any class, a broadcast class, audio, um, and you do something like this. So, an investor offers you $5 million, or maybe it's euro, or 5 million yen, uh, for a new journalism business. You tell your students it must be innovative, geared toward millennials, it has to fill a niche or solve a problem, and it has to become profitable within five years. You give them 10 minutes, you have them meet in groups, and you have them discuss what is the problem that you're trying to solve? What is the need that you're trying to fill? You got to get them thinking about audience. Then you want, to think about, you want them thinking about what's their unique selling proposition. And then finally, you have to get them thinking about how are they going to make money. Then, after 10 minutes of discussion, you have them pitch. You give them 60 seconds. And you want them to be clear, confident, persuasive. All of these are skills that they're going to need in the business world. Again, you want them showing how they are going to solve a problem and they need to be thinking about how they're going to make money. This is something that you can do in almost any class, and you're gonna get students ready for the realities of journalism today. Thank you.
That's good. I didn't trip. That's a good start. Good morning. That's, that's me. I'm just taller and um, I'm skinnier there because I got food poisoning from yogurt in a Mosul. So if you go to a war zone, don't eat yogurt. Um, that's what I've done. That's where I work. I'm from Ireland. Um, if you don't like it, I do apologize, but it's too late for that. I wrote a book. If you want to read the book, there's not much journalism, not much education, but it's a bit of crack uh, and you can get it on Kindle. Right. I'm here to talk about, I do a PhD through practice. I'm halfway through it, and it examines the impact of mobile phone technology on broadcast journalists in a select number of newsrooms around the world. So that's a lot of air miles and also a greater risk of getting more food poisoning. It comprises two elements. I'll make it visual because we're visual people. Where do I? There we go. Oh, no, back. There we go. So that's it. 40,000 word thesis and a 60 minute documentary. For the Americans in the room, it'll be on PBS Passport within a month, and in certain US states, it'll air on your PBS affiliate. It's called The Mojo Revolution. Um, and it questions whether or not using phones to change newsrooms is a revolution or an evolution. It also asks if newsrooms are changing with technology or technology is changing the newsrooms. And what we're seeing in some cases is that it's actually a mix of both. So the approach, five days at each newsroom, it's ethnographic, it's auto-ethnographic. The research questions, what is the driving this transition? It's a fly on the wall piece, so not a whole lot of me in it and mostly a whole lot of people that matter, uh, which are the journalists. This approach allowed these interviewees, which are the reporters, the anchors, the producers from across the world, to dictate the flow of the film, bring the viewer on a journey into their worlds, take them behind the scenes, show us what they do, why they do it, and how they do it. I've shot, edited, and produced this on my own mobile phone, so I'm using the same technology as the case studies. This allows the researcher or the academic the space to reflect, analyze, and in some cases alter my own practice of 10 years using mobile phones to tell stories. Case studies, STV2 in Scotland, which is based where I am, lasted a year, had some issues. Le Mans Bleu in Switzerland, fantastic people. If you're going to be in Switzerland, pop in, say hello to Lauren. Uh, very, very interesting, pioneering uh, news organization for mobile journalism. Uh, CBS affiliate in Tennessee, where I spent a number of years. Uh, one of the first stations in America to adopt mobile journalism and live streaming using the Canadian technology de Gero. And NDTV, which have proven, which was there about four weeks ago, to be truly mind-blowing. They're the first only vertical live streaming channel in the world. Um, and they're partnered with Samsung. And what they do is truly incredible and innovative. So some key debates that we're looking at, the content gatherer versus the reporter. So are we a forager? Are we training our students to be going out and grabbing as much as they can? Or are they still adding an identity to who they are and what they do? The researcher versus the practitioner, the dilemma uh, we all face in many cases. Infrastructure restrictions. So while well, we've got some AC problems here, in other parts of the world we don't have 4G, we don't have 5G or 3G. Altered personal practice. So some of the things that I have done throughout the piece, I've had to change. Become more in tune with audio. There's a pun intended there, probably. Um, and also app usage. A lot of stations are changing away from traditional software, and in some cases, like in NDTV, are designing their own software. Bring this into education. So have the right equipment. Think audio as well as video. Bring in experts. Encourage partial package making on phones. So start off with some package making and then go full. Don't underestimate the skill set of your students. Snapchat, Instagram Live, and Facebook. They're already making videos of their cats. Just get them to think a little bit more creatively about the subject material. Think bite size and think geotagging. The whole documentary, as I said for the Americans, is available on PBS Passport the next few weeks. But if you guys want to use this in your own classrooms, it's available on my YouTube channel uh, under the description. And I just want to say that it's been a pleasure, it's been a privilege and an honor to be here. And we only have one job, and our job is to help people tell their stories. If we can walk away from that and do that and do it to the best of our ability, then we're doing a good job. Thank you. Hello. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ahmed Orabi from Egypt. And first of all, I have to say that this presentation is not for you. It is for our fellow journalism educators in our planets, in our solar system, just for the safety of everybody. So uh, we have uh, something to say about the challenges which uh, our fellow educators in our solar system are facing right now. So the first of all, we have to say that they have physical threat, they are uh, threatened of being uh, prisoned or, uh, or tortured, or even killed. Regarding the economical threat, 
they have a uh, threat of institutional uh, penalties and, uh, and sometimes no promotions, even uh, losing their jobs. And finally, and I think it is a very serious threat, which is teaching what they shouldn't teach. And for that, the main factors is Big Brother is watching them. And for, for that, we have some questions to answer. We, we would uh, uh, ask ourselves how to keep igniting, or they should ask themselves, how to keep igniting the candle of passion, how to keep their uh, students surviving, how to uh, help them to see and say what Big Brother doesn't like to hear. And as I am proposing, the answer is they should go out of their own context. They should use model, uh, uh, they should uh, globalize their uh, journalistic model, and they should look for the history of journalism in different way. For the first one, I think they should focus on stories which uh, from extreme open and extreme uh, closed societies. They should uh, uh, find the stories which, and analyze each uh, story and explain its, uh, its sources. And uh, they should ask, uh, 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 or the educator, educators should ask them to rewrite the stories considering uh, different context and editorial policies. Uh, for all of this, also they should focus on human interest stories rather than politics and economics because they might be in trouble because of that. And uh, regarding the, uh, the, the historical uh, uh, courses, they should, uh, 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 focus on writing stories with deep uh, historical background, and they might use uh, trending keywords uh, from that time and try to find stories in the uh, press archive. I think those uh, suggestions might uh, be very helpful, and as I said, uh, uh, everything uh, mentioned here is not um, uh, um, intended for a specific country, it is, uh, and you can understand why I'm saying that. So thank you very much, and uh, good luck. Thank you. Hello, this is Ambari Shaksena and my colleague uh, Susmita Bala. We have come from India, DME Media School, and uh, we are making a presentation uh, how innovative practices uh, can be introduced in journalism education. So, uh, yeah, next slide. Uh, journalism education, identification of these components, thought, society, polity, economy, and culture and theory, communication theory and models, and skills, handling equipment, new technology, practices, functioning of new media organization. Next slide. Next one. Yeah, so uh, there are four uh, major components that uh, uh, we have identified as far as journalism education is concerned. Uh, this is thought, theory, skill, and uh, practice. Uh, so, uh, in, uh, if we look into as to how much emphasis is to be given uh, to what, then, uh, uh, next slide, next, yeah. So, uh, uh, as we have experienced, uh, we put utmost emphasis on thought, that is uh, on the whole 75%, and in the next 10, 10%, we can put the uh, skill, uh, and then 5% uh, can be the operational part. So uh, what uh, is meant by thought and what all is to be included in thought? So in brief, uh, the historical perspective has to be there wherever the journalists are working or the journalists need to work. And then the social issues need to be uh, told to the students. Then if there are certain uh, un social unrest, so those issues have to be uh, discussed about and the economic issues. Next. 
Then the political issues, the kind of political system uh, which is there in the country, then the constitution and the law, uh, and the bureaucratic setup, and then the police and law and order, and the gender issues. So these are the important issues which need to be addressed at the thought level. Yeah, next. And uh, some additional areas uh, can also be talked about besides that. Uh, so, uh, we uh, want to have a news-based uh, approach uh, in uh, teaching. Uh, news-based approach means uh, uh, the latest news of the day need to be told to the students in a manner uh, wherein they learn by doing that. Yeah. Latest news development be picked up by a, for a study on a particular day, daily newspaper reading, web edition be used on uh, teaching, that is very important. Next. Yeah, so uh, what we do normally, and because I have already experimented this, uh, in the morning we ask them to come, uh, students to come prepared with the latest news of the day. Uh, so, and when they come to the class, either they can go through the hard copies or they can carry the hard copies, but then at the moment, most of the news uh, organizations, they have their app, so they can carry that in their app. Yeah, next. Approach for understanding news development. Teacher need to be in the class for about an one hour. Following this, the student be given an one hour for research and group dis discussion. Read two to three hours of that day be reserved for discussion and uh, these stories in the class. Teacher need to be addressed the issues and answer the qu queries raised by the students. Yeah, next slide. Yeah, so uh, this is one example which I can explain uh, to, to, to explain my point as to how this is to be done. Uh, I think uh, everybody must be aware there was a very uh, big uh, terrorist attack in Kashmir wherein 40 security personnel were killed. Now, if that is the news of the day, now what all we can teach through this is one story only as to what is the uh, background to this uh, conflict, what exactly is the Kashmir problem, what is the policy of the government of India on this issue, the policy with related to the, the, this uh, by the state government, then the laws related to this aspect, because in India we have a lot of such laws which gives excessive powers to the security forces, so what are those laws, what are the implications of those laws, and so uh, at, at least 10 major things can be taught, uh, can be explained simply by referring to uh, one news item. Next. Yeah. So that's all, thank you. Hello, I'm David Shabazz. I'm from Kentucky State University in Frankfort, Kentucky, USA. I'm talking about the seven word story. First of all, I feel it apropos to be here in Paris talking about this because the inspiration for this teaching idea came from the American writer Ernest Hemingway who spent a lot of time in Paris. So what is the seven word visual story? This story, the inspiration came from the legend of Ernest Hemingway being challenged to write a complete story in six words only. I changed it to seven because number one, I wanted to be um, a little original about it, and seven is a prime number. Seven is one of those complete numbers that uh, really prepares you for what it is that you're trying to do. Um, seven is also very significant number in different cultures and practically uh, throughout the country. Um, the objective of this story is to write a complete story using only seven words and seven different camera shots to tell this story. What the students have to do, the focus is on writing. They have to first use their critical thinking skills to come up with a complete story in only seven words. Then they work together with uh, two to three people um, in teams. They develop their storyboards and um, go out and shoot. They have to develop their locations and find everything. And then they, as an individual, they come back and they edit their pieces together. 
the seven basic camera shots that I have them use, and I give them these shots. They have to use the establishing shot, the long shot, the medium, the close up, the low angle, the high angle, and the over the shoulder. Um, their instructions, again, they have to come up with the idea themselves, they have to work together as a team, and then they have to go back individually and edit this. Um, to I think I missed one of my slides here. Um, they have two weeks to do this. So once everybody comes together, they have to use uh, their editing skills and put everything together into this complete package and the assessment. The students are evaluated. They have a checklist. They go through all phases of it, the pre-production, the production, then post, and then the final assessment is through they evaluate each other. And uh, Add one here to show you. That was one of the very first ones. Um, she had the, the full stories, follow your dreams and you'll find your success, and, but it was too big to put on there. And she went back and edited it, but it was done before um, um, the slide was presented. So again, I'm a writing professor, but I teach writing in the context of visual storytelling because that writing sounds boring to students. So when I teach it as visual storytelling, my classes went from being the boring class to one of the most fun now because people get to create projects, they get to think and develop this, and this, again, is a holistic exercise that primes students. It prepares them to go out and make PSAs, to make commercials, to make their feature and news stories, and it has been one of the most effective exercises that I've used. Now, my friends, that is how you teach journalism in a disruptive age. We need another round of applause for these great dozen. And I think we also need a, a thanks to everyone on the technical team who've made this possible from the University of Paris Dauphine. Pascal Guenet, I know you're in here. Pascal, um, shout okay. out. There he is. Come on down. You must be very proud of them. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to invite all 12 of the Ignite presenters up here on the magic stage because that gives the audience more time to vote and you can continue to vote throughout the day. Michael, what final instructions do we have about this most important voting process? They will uh, hopefully put the voting slide up and you have the opportunity to vote either through a web address or through text. If you decide to vote through text, there is a, if you look at it carefully, you spend at Ignites to uh, that number. So you will put in that number, then you will type in the phrase and hit send, and then you send the number of the presentation you want to vote for. You will not get a confirmation that you voted, and you are only able to vote once. So thank you. Please vote. All right, everybody squeeze together. And we'd like to ask Heather to come up for the not working. Oh no, end of the world. Well, well, we'll, we'll sing and dance and just carry on sort of entertaining everybody for a while. I remember this time uh, last year I had to talk about pigeons promenading through the room. Well, I'm not going to do that today. Very good. Oh, very good. <laughs> okay. Heather, could you come up for the photograph? Oh, you're there. <laughs> you heard what I said. It's at this point you discover why I have a face for radio. 
flash, click, click, flash. Just a reminder that we're not going to announce the winners now, as we have done in the past. They will be announced uh, later on in the closing uh, session. So uh, they've still got a lot to uh, worry about over the next few hours. However, I am certain that everybody in this room can take something from every one of those presentations. I know even as a radio tutor, I'm going to take stuff, stuff from the theory, stuff from that GIF or GIF, whichever way, but the Oxford University Dictionary is right in whatever way it says. Um, and we can use those and we can... We can it's live now, thank you. Pascal the magic. Magic Pascal has made it work. So, uh, once again, I think they are all winners. That sounds corny, but I suspect you agree with me. So, would you once again show your appreciation for our fantastic presenters today? And do not move, because right here in the same auditorium is a very important uh, next part of WJEC, which will segue beautifully into actually hearing from the students that we're going to be teaching. We'll turn the time over to Pascal. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you. Bye. Yes. And uh, thank, thank you. And you will be able to vote all. And you will be, you will be able to vote till 4 p.m. So thank you for being here. Yesterday, we were at Paris Town Hall. So uh, I was very pleased to share that with you. And because it's, you know, this WGC is like as my personal Olympics. And you know that in 2024, Paris will have the Olympics. 